Hello everyone and welcome to the Wetlands Mammals presentation today. My name is Katrina Terrell and I'm the Community Engagement Manager for the Alberta Institute for Wildlife Conservation. Now today we're going to be focusing on wetlands mammals as I kind of said, um, but I want to just get started by talking a little bit about the Alberta Institute for Wildlife Conservation or AIWC as we say and what we do with this organization. Just so you know why I'm the one talking to you about wetlands animals and things like that. So if you've never heard of us before, uh, we are a nonprofit organization and we're located just outside of Calgary, Alberta. Now, AIWC is a wildlife rehabilitation center, which means we do three main things. We wild animals who are in distress, and usually it's between one and 2,000 of these animals per year. And by in distress, I mean that an animal is injured or it has been orphaned when it's too young to be on its own and so needs somebody to look after it. Once we've rescued these animals, we rehabilitate them at our hospital. And that means we keep them in a safe place, we treat any injuries that we might, they might have, and we feed them until they are strong enough to actually be released back into the wild. So we don't keep any of these animals on a permanent basis. All of the wildlife that we look after is going back into the wild where it belongs. But that means we do also want to do one other thing. And that's educate the public on wildlife issues so that these animals don't have to come into the hospital in the first place. About 95% of our patients have to come into the hospital because of human caused issues. So by educating the public, fewer animals have to come to the hospital in the first place. And the more we actually get to see these animals enjoying life out in the wild. So that's just a little bit about us, but let's get to the good stuff because you all wanna learn about wetlands mammals today. So just as a quick review, there are many, many different types of wetlands here in Alberta, and animals live in all sorts of these kind of wetland areas. From swamps where there's large trees and water on the ground, to ponds like we might see on our typical farm, we see rivers and streams, which are also great wetlands habitats, and of course, lakes as well are wonderful. But it's not always obvious when an area is a wetland. The definition of a wetland is simply land that is wet. And even this area counts as a wetland. If you've never seen a place like this, this bog here, it's up in northern Alberta. And a bog is a really special kind of wetland because you can't see the water right away. All of that green stuff on the bottom of this area is not grass, it is actually moss. And that moss acts like a giant sponge and sucks up all of the water in the area. You're not gonna know it's there until you step on that moss. And some of these mossy areas can be very deep. In fact, they can be over six feet deep, but you're not gonna know that until you step on them and then have your entire leg soaked because you've pressed out all of the water in that mossy sponge. You might guess I'm speaking from personal experience here. And yes, I absolutely am. Uh, they are very surprising when you're not expecting them. So wetlands can look like really any kind of area. Uh, I always recommend taking a stick if you're not sure if a wet, it's an, a wetland area or not. Um, that way you won't get your whole trouser leg soaked like I did. Now, the reason we love talking about wetlands and wetlands wildlife is because wetlands are full of biodiversity. And biodiversity just means the variety of animals in an area. Now, wetlands have a lot of biodiversity. This can include, of course, many different kinds of plants, but also for animals too. In wetlands, we see many different kinds of insects like water striders and everyone's favorite, the mosquito. We also see amphibians like our tiger salamanders or frogs, reptiles such as garter snakes, and many varieties of birds. From one of my personal favorites, our red-winged blackbird here, but also animals like ducks, geese, and swans who call wetlands home. But we're not talking about any of these today. Wetlands is such a huge topic that I really wanna focus on just one thing. And today we're gonna to be focusing on the mammals who live in our wetlands. Now mammals are different from all of these other animals that I've mentioned here because they are warm blooded, they are furry, and they feed their babies milk. So those are some of the main characteristics of our mammals. And they range in size from, size from very large to very small as well. So we're gonna start off with one of our smaller wetland species, bats. 
wait a second, bats don't swim, but they do still call wetlands home. And so that's why they count as wetlands mammals here. We mostly think of bats as being living in caves or things like that. And that's certainly where a lot of bats like to sleep. But most Alberta species of bats spend their waking hours feeding near wetlands. And that's a very, very important thing because all nine of Alberta's bat species are insectivores. As you might guess from that name, it means they like eating insects. And since wetlands have only a large number of insects, well, this makes wetlands the perfect place for bats to spend their time. Mainly, bats are there for eating a couple different kinds of insects. They do enjoy eating mosquitoes, but their absolute favorite is eating moths. Now, we want to make sure we keep our bats around and very happy because even a single little brown bat can eat over 3,000 mosquitoes in a single night. Very important for humans, very important for the entire ecosystem as well. So bats are a great example of a wetlands mammal. We also see weasels calling wetlands home. Now, Alberta's home to many different species of weasels, but two of them, our mink and our river otter, actually prefer to live almost exclusively in wetlands because mainly these two weasels are really the ones who like to swim a lot. Both mink and otter love being in the water and they are excellent swimmers who eat mostly fish. So our, you can, if you're walking around a wetland, you can definitely pick up maybe uh, some tracks of our mink or our weasels. Look for the five toes. That's very, very important for differentiating weasel tracks from something like a dog or a cat who usually only have four toes showing on their tracks. Now, some of our wildlife species in wetlands are very, very large. And the largest of the wildlife mammals that you're likely going to see in a wetland are our moose. Now, you look at a moose's face. They are entirely adapted for life in wetlands. In fact, their whole bodies are adapted for this. Those incredibly long, stilt-like legs, well, they kind of look a little bit awkward on flat areas, are absolutely perfect for wading and swimming through ponds and lakes. And yes, moose do swim and they're quite good at it. We even see moose go past canoes sometimes. So they're really excellent at, at um, swimming through the water. And if you look at their faces, their faces are also fantastic for being in a wetland. Moose really enjoy eating the, uh, the shrubs and the pond weed that's actually on the bottom of some of these lakes and ponds. And that long face is perfect for dipping completely underwater, uh, making sure they're not getting lots of water in their ears or anything, and using the lovely long lips to actually grab at plants on the bottom of the wetlands. So moose are fantastic at getting all of these kinds of things out of the wetlands areas. Now, there's one other group of mammals that I really want to talk about, and these two are our rodents. Rodents living exclusively in wetlands, we actually call them semi-aquatic mammals because they are so well adapted for being in the water. And two of these rodent species, beavers and muskrats, are what we call keystone species. It means they are key to wetland survival and, of course, for the survival of other animals living in wetlands as well. Now, if you don't know how to tell beavers and muskrats apart, there's a few really good tricks and tips that I can show you here. So the uh, animal on our left is the beaver. The one on the right is our muskrat. And the best way to tell these guys apart if you happen to catch a glimpse of a rodent hanging around in the wetland is by looking at their tails. So their tails are going to tell you which is which. Beavers have a wide, flat tail, it's very well adapted for slapping mud down onto their dams. Muskrats, on the other hand, have a long, skinny tail that works really well at steering them around into smaller areas. And that's pretty key for the muskrats because they're also very much smaller than beavers, which is another major difference between these guys. North American beavers can weigh up to 32 kilograms. They are large animals. By contrast, our muskrats tend to top out only about two kilograms in weight. So they're a much, much smaller species than our beavers are. If you ever happen to see something like this, 
well, I can promise you a muskrat did not build that, they will only usually make these kind of dams across very small streams. Beavers, on the other hand, as you've probably seen before, will change their entire environment. They will block full rivers with trees, with sticks, with anything they can find, and seal it all up with mud that they'll push in with their hands and their tail. Now, these beaver dams create incredible habitat for other wildlife species. As you can see, just behind this beaver dam is what we call a beaver pond. That's a nice, deep, very calm area where animals like fish will often spawn. And so the little fish will start their lives in this calm environment. Lots of birds really enjoy having their babies learn how to swim in this kind of environment as well. It's very calm, very gentle. We have many frog species who will lay their eggs in beaver ponds. And of course, other mammals like our moose really enjoy living in beaver ponds because there's lots of different kind of plants for them to come and munch on. So beavers are really what we call a keystone species because they're creating habitat for many, many, many other species of both plants and animals. If we take the beavers out of the wetlands, well, then we don't have nearly as much good quality habitat and we're not gonna see nearly as many wetland species in those areas either. Now, unfortunately, there are several threats to wetlands that are currently happening right now. And one of the biggest ones is pollution. Now, of course, pollution is mostly human caused. And what we're seeing is that the biggest culprits are runoff from cities and from farming areas as well. When I say runoff, I mean that water has actually fallen in these areas, so rain or snow, and then it washes out a lot of chemicals present in city or farm environments. And where water goes, it's going downhill, it's going into the wetlands. And so this pollution is actually changing the water quality and making it a lot harder for plants and animals to live in those areas. So runoff from cities and agriculture is really a big, big problem. We're also seeing, though, that people are using really harsh chemicals to do a lot of cleaning in their house. Those chemicals go into the water treatment system. Now, of course, they are going to be treated, but they do end up still diluted into our wetland systems. So using really harsh chemicals can also be a, a really bad pollution factor for our wetlands. We humans, though, we do have options. We can actually use fewer harsh chemicals. And if you really want to get uh, gung ho about it, you can make your own cleaner using very simple natural ingredients. Things like lemon juice, vinegar and baking soda are all major ingredients and they're not going to be harmful to wetlands, even if they do get washed down the drain. So something to try, maybe if you're feeling a little adventurous and you want to try making your own chemicals, very, very easy to make your own cleaners. Other major threats to our wetlands mammals, unfortunately, it's us. And it's often humans just not really thinking and accidentally doing things that can hurt our wetlands animals. For instance, littering. The most common litter we see in our wetlands are things like fishing gear, balloon pieces, and other general food wrappers and garbage. Now, the reason that litter is such a big problem, in addition to being very ugly to look at, is that a lot of our wetlands animals will actually eat this kind of garbage or get tangled up in it. This x-ray here is actually showing you a goose that has swallowed a fish hook. So that needed surgery to be taken out. We see ducks who will eat balloon pieces, thinking that they're berries or some other form of actual edible food. And we see animals getting entangled in pop can rings or fishing line all the time too. Another major threat is one that you might not expect. Feeding wildlife can be really, really dangerous for them. And this is something that we're only starting to really think about in the last few years. For instance, I grew up feeding the ducks in my area and I used to feed them bread. And many, many, many people grew up with a similar experience. But what science has actually found now is bread is very, very bad for a lot of our wetland species. In fact, it can cause huge algal growth all over uh, the wetland areas and actually kind of suffocate some of the plants that normally would live there. Plus, if we start feeding bread to things like ducks or geese, well, bread has a lot of sugar in it that their bodies are not up for digesting. 
and we're starting to see ducks come in with diabetes, with heart disease, and even a bone disease called angel wing, which is directly attributed to eating too much bread when they're ducklings. So feeding wildlife is also a big no-no, and it's something that we really need to stop as soon as possible. And pets are also a big threat to our wetland species right now, especially pets who are roaming off leash. If you are near a wetland, even if you're in an off leash dog park, I strongly, strongly recommend that you make sure that your dog is on leash, not just for the wildlife's sake, although of course that's important, but also for your dog's safety too. Chasing a porcupine or chasing a beaver can lead to your dog getting seriously injured. If you have them on a leash, they are not going to be able to do that, no matter how desperately they want to go and play with that animal. The wildlife does not want to play with our pets and will defend themselves if your pets get too close. So it's always a good idea to have your dogs on a leash, especially in wetlands areas. Cats, as you can see from this picture, are very detrimental to our wildlife, especially to our bird species. Cats are in fact the number one killer of bird species in Canada. So we wanna make sure our cats are always inside or on a leash. Even if you think your cat would never try and hurt a bird, unfortunately they will. And they will absolutely try and uh, bring home an extra present for you every once in a while. You don't wanna see that, you don't wanna have that happen. We want to make sure that our birds are around for many, many years to come. So please just keep your cats inside or on a leash if you're walking them around. And that's the best thing we can do for our wetlands animals. So there's many different ways we can help out our wetlands mammal species. As we've said, just making sure we collect all of our garbage, putting it into bins, or even creating less garbage in the first place, that's going to really help them out. We want to try and use eco-friendly cleaning products and make sure that we're not putting too many chemicals down the drain. We want to make sure we keep our pets on a leash or inside at all times and keep our hands and food to ourselves too. If you ever find an animal that is injured or that you think is orphaned, make sure you call your local wildlife rehab center. We are always available to help out with any questions or concerns that you might have. And if you're not in the Calgary area, don't worry, we can help you figure out who is going to be your closest wildlife rehabbers. So that does bring me to the end of our Wetlands Wildlife presentation. Thank you all so much for your attention and for supporting wildlife in need. We really, really appreciate it. If you do have any questions about this presentation or about any kind of wildlife topic in general, you're welcome to email us at education at AIWC. And if you enjoyed the presentation and you want to actually help support the wildlife that we're looking after, like these two moose calves right here, you can donate to our hospital by using the following link. Thank you again, everyone, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.